I just want to welcome everybody to our webinar, our Flashpoint Kazakhstan today. Uh, so my name is Adam Casey. I'm a postdoc here at the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, moderate this panel today with a series of esteemed experts on Kazakhstan and the former Soviet Union. So many of us have been following the news out of Kazakhstan for the last uh, couple of weeks with great interest, and the four panelists here have been watching Kazakhstan closely for far longer than that. So I'll briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, um, uh, so excuse me, one of whom will be with us being a uh, recorded video today. So Pauline Jones is Professor of Political Science uh, and Director of the Digital Islamic Studies Curriculum here at the University of Michigan. She previously served as the University of Michigan Islamic Studies Program and International Institute Directors. Her past works contributed broadly to the study of institutional origin, change, and impact uh, with an empirical focus on the former Soviet Union, primarily the five Central Asian republics. Currently, she's engaged in two major research projects. One explores the influence of religion on political attitudes and behavior in Muslim majority states, with an emphasis on the relationship between political, uh, religious regulation, excuse me, religiosity and political mobilization. Her other major project focuses identifying the factors that, ex that affect the extent to which people are complying with social distance policies to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of these policies on individuals and communities around the world. Uh, joining us virtually is uh, Nursit Nyazbekov, uh, who will be, he's an assistant professor, excuse me, in the Department of International Relations at KMAP University in Kazakhstan. He holds a PhD in politics and a uh, master's in sociology from the University of Oxford. He's taught at other universities in Kazakhstan and has conducted research at international and non-governmental organizations. Uh, he often consults international think tanks and researchers on issues related to political risk, democratization, social welfare, and protests in Kazakhstan. His research interests revolve around post-communist transitions, Central Asian politics, social movements, social capital, and protest mobilization. Edward Schatz is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. He recently published Slow Anti-Americanism, Social Movements and Symbolic Politics in Central Asia with Stanford University Press. His previous books include Paradox of Power, The Logics of State Weakness in Eurasia, and Political Ethnography, What Immersion Contributes to the Study of Power. His research interests include social mobilization, identity politics, qualitative methods, the former USSR, and Central Asia. And last but not least, Regina Smith is Professor of Political Science at Indiana University. Her primary research interest is the dynamics of state-society relations in transitional and electoral authoritarian regimes. She's written extensively on political development, uh, excuse me, political development in the Russian Federation, including a recent book, Elections, Protests, and Authoritarian Regime Stability, Russia 2008 through 2020 with Cambridge University Press. Her research, largely based on original data collection and analysis, has been funded by a variety of highly prestigious grant organizations, including the National Science Foundation, International Research and Exchanges Board, and the U.S.-Russia Foundation. So each panelist will give a brief set of remarks, uh, and then we'll be opening the discussion up to the audience. So please submit your questions via the Q&A tab on Zoom at any point during the presentations, uh, and I will read the questions aloud to the panelists uh, during the Q&A section. So we're really lucky to have a terrific slate of programming here at WCED in the coming semester, uh, and we will hope you'll join us for our next event on Tuesday, January 25th at 5 o'clock for another great panel entitled Lobbying the Autocrat. With another great set of experts, this looks at advocacy networks in, and organizations, how they work under autocracy. So without further ado, I will turn it over virtually to Nurseet, um, who will be starting us off. Thanks. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear guests. My name is uh, Nurseet Nyazbev, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of International Relations here in Almaty at uh, Kimap University. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to thank uh, Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies and uh, to present at this um, uh, round table. I will talk about what's happening right now in Kazakhstan. Um, all of what I'm gonna share with you today is based on my own observations of uh, uh, international media, of uh, social media, and my own eyewitness accounts of participating in those riots. So I will answer uh, predominantly four questions. The first question will be, what happened in Kazakhstan? And then I'm gonna look at uh, who did it? What I saw in the riots in Almaty, where I'm currently based. I will look at the government's response, and then I will say a few words about the public uh, response. I will conclude this with my own uh, 
uh, thoughts regarding uh, what's going to happen next and what should we expect from the, the president and his team. Right this minute, the President Tokayev is giving a speech in the Parliament of Kazakhstan in, in Nur Sultan, where he is introducing the, the new cabinet. And because the internet is not stable, and I'm not even sure if there will be internet in the afternoon today, I am pre-recording this session. So I will target, I will aim at uh, finishing in uh, eight to 10 minutes. So let me quickly share my screen. So what happened? Uh, as you may know, as you have been following the international uh, uh, news, um, first the protests began in the cities of Zhanaozeng on the 2nd of January when the government announced its plan to increase the price of liquid gas. Thousands of protesters gathered uh, in the cities of Zhanaozeng and act out to demand the cancellation of this price increase. The government immediately responded by denouncing their plans to increase the, the price. Um, so because the government promised to keep the old prices only for the Western Kazakhstan region, masses in the rest of Kazakhstan were upset and started to mobilize around purely socioeconomic grievances. On January the 3rd and the 4th, peaceful protests erupted in the major cities across the country. Initially, these protests were self-organized and they were quite full in nature. However, they were quickly joined by anyone who is not happy with the government. And by anyone, I mean the religious extremists, unemployed, the radicals, the criminals, um, anyone who is idle, in other words, right? And anyone who uh, sees this as an opportunity to, um, to improve their their well-being, right, by robbing or by protesting along the peaceful protesters to demand the improvement of their welfare. However, on the January 4th and the 6th, there was little to no signs of the peaceful protesters across the country, with this exception of Aktau. So in Aktau, there were still peaceful protesters. But in other cities, including Almaty, where I'm based, all these peaceful protests turned violent. And these are some of the photos which I took during the events um, ten, uh, five, five days ago, yes. So here you can see uh, protesters burning the police vehicles. These are protesters outside of the Almaty local government. Here they're trying to storm the president's palace in Almaty. We can see here traces of blood. I saw uh, the bullets uh, hitting the people uh, protesting alongside. And here you can see women wearing a flag of Kazakhstan and all this ammunition which was taken away from the military and the policemen. Here standing uh, is the police trying to defend the president's palace and I was among the crowd uh, uh, watching the police basically shooting sound grenades and tear gas at the mass. Here we can see the local government in flames and the people here are trying to formulate their demands. So what I saw during the riots, I marched with the crowd in Almaty from the outskirts to the lo local government on January the 5th. Observed the crowd storm the police and government buildings, attack the police and military, marauding shops and destroying public property. Demographically, there were very few women and elderly people. Majority were uh, in their 20s and 40s. Most are ethnic Kazakhs, they speak Kazakh, and there were very few non-Kazakhs. There were no slogans, no banners whatsoever. Uh, I saw people only shouting, Shal Ket, which in Kazakh means old man leave, obviously meaning President Nazarbayev um, and his team. Police was blocking the streets as long as they could using the military trucks, buses, they were shooting sound and light grenades and tear gas. No lethal weapons were used during the street march, but military defending the president's residence near Dakimat was shooting the AK-47 and sniper rifles using obviously the lethal weapons. And we saw traces of blood in the previous uh, photos. No water cannons were used at all. Next on the 5th of January, rioters drove cars with no number plates. 
later these cars were used to rob the shops and to carry the rob, uh, robbed property. Um, these cars were distributing food and drinks to the marches. Some rioters, mainly women and uh, elderly, tried defending the captive policemen and the soldiers. They, should, they said that the protesters should not harm them because they are sons of the Kazakh nation and, and so on and so forth. Many from these um, uh, groups uh, called on stopping the war during. Early on, on the 5th January, rioters were armed mainly with knives, clubs, steel fittings, and stones. Later in the day, however, because rioters robbed the rifle shops and the police stations, they acquired weapons. No police or military whatsoever was visible in the city since January the 5th midday until January the 6th, right, uh, in, the, in the late evening. During this time, violence, murdering, and complete disorder and chaos was taking place. Internet outage began on January the 5th and continues up to the present day. So who did it? There are three no's here. First, there was no sign of Kazakhstan's formal or informal organization's involvement. Devika, the notorious Abyazov, was absent. Wayan Kazakhstan, uh, the Koshe Party, Democratic Party, none of them were amongst the protesters. There was also no trace of any social or religious movement, no civic activists or no opinion leaders involved. And I saw them. I didn't see any of them in the crowd. No evidence of foreign intervention, no Chinese, no Russian, no uh, Western or any other troops involved here, with the exception of, of course, the collective security treaty organization's troops. Okay, so they're not only Russia's troops, they're also troops from uh, Belarus and Armenia but they were all representing the CSTO troops together. Peaceful protests were self-mobilized utilizing social media, but they were later joined by what government officially calls terrorist groups aimed at the coup d'etat. This is what the government has been uh, translating and uh, sending a message across to the people uh, throughout the, the days. What is the government's response? Disturbed by the country-wide escalation of peaceful gas protests, the government immediately revoked its decision on price increase, but was unprepared to face the transformation of protesters into all-out violent riots. Government's intelligence and security apparatus either underestimated or completely ignored the potential radicalization of protests in Kazakhstan cities. This is why President Tokai first fired Masimov from the post of National Security Committee and then dissolved the cabinet. Due to the failure of law enforcement to contain violence, Tokayev requested help from CSTO in the form of peacekeeping troops, which were deployed on January the 5th to cities of Nur Sultan and Almaty. Officials claim that CSTO troops helped take control of Almaty and other cities by the end of January the 6th. Currently, the National Army and police are finalizing counter-terrorist operations in Almaty and Talukurgan, the cities with the largest casualties among the civilian and among the police and destroyed infrastructure. What about the public's response? Judging from the formal and social media, my own conversations with the people across Kazakhstan over the phone and industry, fellow academics and experts, I observe the following um, facts. First, there is a popular disillusionment with Nazarbayev, his family and supporting elites. There is a growing popularity of Tokayev, his policy decisions, and continued presence during the turmoil. Tokayev did not leave the country. He was online all through the events. There is also widespread disapproval of violence and the murdering. So the public is highly critical of this. There is approval of government communication strategy. Uh, through By sending the SMS messages, people were kept in the loop of what's going on in the country. So the government was keeping the feedback mechanisms intact. There is growing collaboration, public collaboration with the military in punishing the perpetrators. And the public in general shows interest in helping the government catch these perpetrators. There are now also heightened expectations of the future post-Nazarbayev reforms. So to conclude, elite, uh, conflict or clan conflict is evident in Kazakhstan between the Nazarbayev and Tokayev supporting elites and the groups. About 10 years ago, uh, people were asking what would happen when Nazarbayev dies or when he steps down. 
one of the scenarios was uh, the Nazarbayev would appoint somebody who would carry on his uh, policy. Okay, this is what happened uh, three years ago when Nazarbayev appointed Tokayev. But there was another scenario when Nazarbayev would unexpectedly pass away or his followers, his elites would challenge the new incumbent, the Nazarbayev's incumbent in order to take control of the power. And this is what um, happened in Kazakhstan, in my opinion. Paralyzation of police and military during the 4th and the 6th January throughout the country is viewed by Tokayev as a sabotage by security apparatus. Hence the resignation of the top security officials and Tokayev's replacement of Nazarbayev as a head of security council. Next, currently the Nazarbayev's elites are bargaining to save face and minimize harm to their business and security interests. While Tokayev, with the help of Putin, remember the um, CSTO troops, Tokayev is trying his best to consolidate the power and enhance his legitimacy in the absence of Nazarbayev around. How he's going to achieve this? He's going to announce a new cabinet, which is done by the time that I'm going to finish with this presentation, we will appoint a new cabinet. He's going to also pursue a very harsh and public punishment of the terrorists and those behind. So according to some um, uh, opinion, it was the Nazarbayev's nephews, the Nazarbayev's family members in Almaty district who were behind this plot. Next, Tokayev will denounce previously enacted unpopular decrees, uh, including the one uh, that, in, that was about to increase the price of the gas, and there are many others. Next, he's going to introduce some populist policies, again, in order to enhance his legitimacy and to strengthen his, his, uh, his rule. And finally, one should also expect a potential dissolution of the parliament. Okay, and um, someone might even speculate that he's going to go as far as uh, change or return back the name of the Nur Sultan to Astana. He's going to change the name of the university, holding the Nazarbayev University, change the street names and everything. But time will show if this is uh, true or not. But in general, there is a very optimistic mood in Kazakhstan. And the people are trying to um, aggregate, trying to, be, to come around uh, Tokayev as their new president, as somebody who put an end to these violent riots, as somebody who was around while Nazarbayev is still, there's still no signs of Nazarbayev. So this is um, my account of what happening, what's happening in Kazakhstan. I would like to wish all of you a very fruitful discussion and all the best from Almaty, Kazakhstan. Take care and bye. All right, thank you for very illuminating remarks, uh, Remarks, excuse me, from Nursi. Uh, so next we'll have Ed Schatz from the University of Toronto. And I can't stop, start my video. Somebody needs to do that for me, I think. Uh, Derek, that should be, uh... oh, okay. oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, fabulous, great. Thanks, no, that was, uh, that was a terrific, you know, setting of the stage for thinking about this. And of course the firsthand account by somebody on the ground is, is is absolutely essential. I might, um, you know, there are other there are other accounts, and so, some of them are going to be a little bit different from what we got from from Nursid, and at least at the margins. And so that's worth uh, worth considering as well. Um, I want to use my time, which is a little bit a little bit shorter than Nursid's, uh, to make two or three central points about how we might conceptualize the events that we just saw in Kazakhstan over the past. What is it now? <laughs> a little more than a week, I lose track of time. The first point I wanna make is that when we narrate the uh, Kazakhstani events, we tend to start with the fuel price hike at the beginning of the year, or maybe if we wanna go back in time, we go back to the Jana Uzen events, the so-called Jana Uzen massacre in 2011, when striking oil workers were um, killed on, on mass in, a, in a, what became a national tragedy. But my contention here, my point, my first point will be that that uh, social mobilization and, and contentious politics have been going on for much longer than that and have been much more continuous and much less punctuated than th that kind of account would suggest. So that's the first point. The second point is that we often will hear uh, the events in Kazakhstan uh, described as, as being spontaneous. 
And there's something to that uh, depiction. They were indeed surprising in their scope and in their the rapidity with which they they developed. In fact, all you had to do was blink, and the the whole trajectory of events changed within the span of, of 24 hours. We were talking about this being potentially revolutionary mobilization, and then all of a sudden it was the revenge of the regime. Um, but the word spontaneity, I would suggest, or the word spontaneous, um, may be misleading. It leads us away from thinking about what resources were available, what forms of organization or proto-organization were in place, what grievances might have looked like and what framing efforts, uh, though modest, uh, they may have been, were already underway. In other words, the kinds of things that social uh, movement theories point us to, um, at least in some modest way, are worth considering. And then the third point I wanna make is, it, it comes from a point or a question that uh, Luke and Wei at, uh, from Toronto asked, at another panel on, on the Kazakhstani events. And he said, how do we explain the sudden collapse of the security forces with the exception of Almaty where, where they, they, they hung on um, obviously in the face of, of what seemed to be somewhat modest street mobilization. This was not Maidan, um, this, was, this was something, uh, something smaller. And answer, I've thought about that question and I wanna posit here that we should consider the role of network ties that extend between the protesters and the, and the regime. In, order, in other words, focus on the interconnections between regime and society rather than imagine them as necessarily pitted uh, one against the, the other. So the first point, um, these events were part of a larger, uh, longer cycle of contention. Uh, we wanna make sure not to conflate two things. On the one hand are protests that are easily visible, right? Even beyond the borders of Kazakhstan, things like the Jean Uzan massacre. And on the other hand are protests or quieter forms of contestation that are visible within the country or maybe visible within particular regions or locales within uh, the country. So let me briefly sketch out some of the protests that usually don't make it onto our radars, but that become locally significant or even, uh, even regionally significant. Go back to the uh, wave of coal miner strikes in, in the late 1980s, right? I know people don't want the deep history, but this, this is where um, some of this stuff begins to uh, gain some momentum. Across, the, across Soviet, then Soviet space, this, would, uh, this included the Karaganda region in 1989. Similar events in independent Kazakhstan, um, coal miner strikes in 92, 94, 95, they spill over into, uh, from, the, uh, from the Karaganda region into the Pavlodar. Uh, region. This is not just coal miners. This is not just the north of the country. We see mobilization in the southern towns of, of Kentau and Janatas in, a, in um, a refinery and a phosphorus plant, uh, respectively. And all of these uh, instances of mobilization, uh, all of these really wildcat strikes is what they are, are curtailed eventually by regional authorities through a combination of coercion and some degree of, of concessions, although the concessions are more often promised than they are in fact, uh, you know, the, in fact delivered on, right? 2003 in Gluboka, a small East Kazakhstan town that had three copper smelting, uh, one of three copper smelting plants for the giant Kazakhmus, and, and it goes on and on. 2004, 2005 uh, in the West, uh, oil has come online, pumping oil uh, significantly, and the Tengiz field in 2004, uh, five, and six sees, um, in some cases, inter-ethnic conflict over difference in wages between Turkish workers from Turkey and local Kazakh workers. And then 2011, Jean Uzen, massacre of protesters. And this becomes a, you know, a cause celeb for those who are um, attuned to regime um, brutality. And we could go on, right, uh, in 2018 and in column costs and so on. So the point is that this is a longstanding sort of, sort of pattern. It it's kind of depends on where we're looking, whether we see it as continuous or discontinuous. And if we expand this, the notion of contention a little bit further to things that Jim Scott long ago identified, right? These sort of everyday forms of resistance, we recognize that even under an authoritarian uh, system, uh, contention occurs in lots of different ways and the spectrum uh, with which it, it happens is broad indeed. The second point on uh, spontaneity. Um, certainly the protests uh, were disorganized. Uh, even chaotic, um, even before the, the uh, arrival of um, those who were intent on, uh, on creating violence. And it was leaderless, right? Or maybe, maybe there were you know, leaders here and there, but there was no, uh, no clear uh, leadership. But 
here, if we look to Wendy Perlman's work on Syria, right? And she has a couple of interesting um, pieces recently. I think it's very instructive. She talks about mobilization from scratch, meaning that there really aren't, we shouldn't be thinking about mobilization as, as having particular preconditions. Um, a lot of the things that we assume to be necessary for mobilization can materialize quite quickly. So, and this is more in the form of hypothesis because I'm not on the ground in Kazakhstan, haven't done the research, but um, how might the resources that are typically necessary for mobilization have been initially absent, but materialized quickly? How might political opportunity also initially absent, right? Because this is an authoritarian regime seem to have pretty, pretty clear control. How can um, this political opportunity be rapidly opened in a cascade of new possibilities? You could theorize that in a variety of ways. How might the typical story of top-down framing strategies, right, by mobilizers seeking to recruit for a particular agenda, and I've used that, uh, that, that uh, framework myself, how might that be uh, complemented by considering myriad multiplying bottom-up or horizontal framing efforts, right? So if we expand our field of vision to things like what's happening in the arts or what's happening in music, you know, I mean, I know that's not the bread and butter of political science, but these things too may in small ways animate um, small forms of protest and can gain momentum as we, um, as we, um, as we see um, particularly through social media and so on. And finally, we should consider what grievances come to mean. And here, um, you know, the tension uh, would be to symbolic politics, right? This is the stuff that Erica Simmons um, talks about. In a purely material sense, prices on liquid petroleum gas are of major concern to the drivers uh, who rely on the fuel, the taxi drivers and others who rely on this fuel. But the price hike somehow resonated across the country and across society. It was metonymy, right? It was adjacent to, but 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 indexed a whole series of related grievances about how an energy rich but tone deaf regime treats its general population. So the final point uh, in response to Luke and Wei's interesting question: How should we understand the dynamics between security services and protesters? Again, realm of hypothesis, but it seems consistent with the research that I've done uh, over the years across uh, this space. The first thing to notice, and this might be obvious, but there's a lot of variation in how this particular question plays itself out by region in, in Kazakhstan. We're getting a, a bit of a clear, clear story, but one of the things we know is that Almaty is the outlier here, right? It hangs on, uh, it, it acquires an entirely different dynamic. And one might ask why. One of the questions might have to do with infighting in the political elite, and that's the story that seems to be taking hold. It's probably true. Um, but it's also maybe true, and I would hypothesize that we should we should um, consider this, that the size of Almaty, the professionalization of the of the local police, the distance, social distance between these institutions in a very, very large city, right? Um, and the bulk of the population in that city might be much greater than what you see in other much smaller cities, right? So, you know, uh, uh, so if, if, if Almaty is close to 3 million people and uh, Nur Sultan is maybe a million, Shemkent is just under a million, I mean, we're getting, uh, we're getting to different kinds of relationships potentially between the regime and society or between the security services and society. And so what we see outside of Almaty as the outcome, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, there are many locales I don't know specifically what happened, but the ones we have reports for is that, you know, at some point protesters are left to their own devices, right, by the security services. They don't want to crack down, they let them have, have their way, or, or I guess, and in some cases, security forces visibly cross over to support the, the, the protesters themselves. And so the suggestion might be that there might be some kind of, you know, uh, network of personal ties or of kinship ties or of other kinds of informal connections between key uh, figures in the in the regime and um, the broader society, uh, depending on the place um, and depending on the, um, uh, the the part of Kazakhstan that we're talking about. So those are the three points, and I look forward to hearing what other folks have to say. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Ed. Uh, that was really illuminating. Um, so I guess next we'll have uh, Regina Smith from Indiana University in Wilmington. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, a thank you to Derek for organizing this great panel. Um, people who know my work know I'm not a Kazakh specialist of 
by design, but there are two strands of my work that really lead me to pay attention to what's happening in Kazakhstan. Uh, the first is the type of informal mobilization that Ed just talked about, the sort of below the radar non-political protest. And I'll make a little bit of a slightly different argument that he made about that work. And the second is, um, the interaction between protest and elections over time, which have led me to pay attention to what's happening in Kazakh elections. Like Ed, I want to always, my work and in, in here, extend the time horizons beyond the crisis or before the crisis to look at the issues that create friction between the formal political system and the society, to look at governance, to look at elections, and uh, how they produce uh, and shape available strategies and tactics for both state and social actors. The first thing I want to talk about here, though, having said that, is the actual decision to raise energy prices, which is really puzzling. And I think the answer to that question will provide a really interesting window into what was happening in Kazakh governance, because it really shows that the state had gotten away from its society that who didn't understand the grievances within the society, but also that it was a classic dictator's dilemma where the, the understanding or the mechanisms to understand what was happening within society had broken down quite substantially. And it's especially puzzling because uh, energy prices, transport costs have been a trigger for large scale protests across the globe, not only in post Soviet states, most recently in Armenia, but in France and Spain, as well as Ecuador and Chile. And so it really underscores the lack of sort of learning or attention. This type of suddenly imposed grievance, which are information carriers for the, for the citizens of a regime, and they carry information about the true nature of the regime and the nature of the relationship between state and society. And as with most of these sort of suddenly imposed grievances, the societal response is almost always immediately linked to deeper structural concerns about youth unemployment, about inequality and corruption. And all of these grievances are present in Western Kazakhstan and have been sites of contestation over the past few years. So we're, and including, uh, you know, for quite a long time. My work also uh, sort of highlights the importance of these apolitical, sort of purely economic or everyday grievances. And here's, I think, where I'm differing slightly from what Ed just argued as sources of or, um, infrastructure, mobilization infrastructure, or the accumulation of uh, shared identities, frames, tactics that are hidden from view, but spring out in, the, in response to some of these suddenly imposed grievances or flash uh, actions. And here's a reason um, I, I keep pounding the drum and arguing that we need uh, to maintain a close study of social forces as difficult as it is in these states in order to really understand what's going on. That is just studying elite politics doesn't get us there. One point I'd add from my own work is the role of controlled or manipulated elections in also building infrastructure that's activated by a suddenly imposed grievance. So that there is a sort of deep underlying um, shared sense of the lack of representation of an accountability in government. And it's true that when people talk about these authoritarian elections, they're often dismissed as not being important. But that's because we focus on outcomes, which really reflect state control of electoral processes, but probably not even state capacity. But we don't look beyond it to think about how they create wells of emotion, anger, for example, frustration, um, and then, but also skills and frames and things that can be used in response to an unexpected trigger. 
then the protests themselves become mobilizing forces where emotion again becomes very important. So we read uh, firsthand accounts about um, rooted in anger, but also about hopefulness, about people recognizing others like them on the streets. And these bring out bystanders or observers who weren't usually connected to politics, may even be considered apathetic, a word that doesn't really capture sort of the relationship between the state and the society needs investigation. So these long-term accumulation of social frustrations um, are important. And I think they help to explain protest escalation in Kazakhstan, bottom-up protest es escalation in Kazakhstan, and the shift from economic uh, to political claims. Let me just note that if we think about elections as being important, there has been persistent protest over electoral manipulation growing uh, high in 2019, increased in January 2021, where turnout and support for Nur Otan were lowest in the Western regions where this protest started, sort of suggesting a link, right? Again, hypothesis territory where we need more work. Frustration did spill onto the streets around protest 2021, just in January of last year, so almost a year ago. And the framing of these protests around elections were reflected in the framing of some of the protests we just saw, including the lack of representation, call for regional reforms, and the failure to fulfill promises from Tokayev uh, in, in the previous couple of years. Um, and I just wanna point out, because I, I think this way, that it, these raises some challenging questions for the regime, uh, particularly if Nursayid is, is right and there's, uh, the parliament is dissolved, then you have really important questions about how the regime will deal with the reinvention of the dominant party and how it, how it seizes that from Nazarbayev and breaks with the Nazarbayev frame. And watching that will tell us a lot about things going forward. It will have to see if the calls for regional elections are implemented, another sort of important marker going forward and then how the regime reorganizes to control those regional officials and re-centralize to prevent regional machines from emerging quite quickly uh, in some of these regions. So finally, um, I wanna talk just uh, uh, the third point, third point from my work is that we need to pay attention to the tactics to manage um, potential dissent going forward, but including how the state is gonna deal with massive arrests. So we see co-optation of uh, citizens in dealing with violent protesters, but how will they deal with nonviolent protesters who are arrested? Among the 10,000 arrested, more than 10,000, close to 15 now, as I understand, not all of these folks are gonna be violent people. And so separating out those stories uh, is going to be important going forward. So finally, Ed made this point, let me amplify it uh, in a different way. These are two different events as I see them. First, a bottom-up peaceful protest, and then sort of a co-optation of that protest by elites. They highlight local and regional differences in Kazakhstan, urban-rural differences, bottom-up, top-down impulses, and any complete explanation will encompass nuances rather than some sort of um, stress on one or the other. So we need to take society seriously as an actor, but with care not to make society a unitary actor, right? Um, and we need more research focus on what's going on in small towns and rural provinces to anticipate this study. Second of all, and here's where I'm gonna end, is to ask all of us to take more time to untangle the relationship between protest top down and bottom up. Um, Ed brilliantly just pointed out that this is gonna vary across cities. It's certainly gonna vary across cases so that we really are at the very beginning in social science to think about how these two impulses interact and to really theorize about the factors that shape those interactions, um, including the nature of the patronage state, the organization of elite business, uh, the 
control of the security services, structural issues like class, urban, rural, and cleavages, and so forth. So here's where there's a real big project in front of us to move forward. And I'll end there. Great, thanks for another set of really interesting remarks. And last but certainly not least, we have University of Michigan's own uh, Pauline Jones. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, thank you for stepping in and uh, moderating. It's really uh, great to have you. Uh, I wanna thank Derek Groom and Dan Slater who wasn't able to be here for organizing this panel. And I wanna thank my panelists because um, they gave such a great uh, set of remarks and set me up so well uh, that I can build on their insight. So, um, I think we've heard a lot um, on this panel and, and elsewhere about what these, um, how these protests started, who was involved, what they might mean, how we should interpret them. And that's all great and that's all important. I have been trying to shift focus um, in my own thinking about this to what this all means for the future of Kazakhstan. It's a country I've been studying for decades and that I care deeply about. And so it's, it's something that's really um, uh, kept, kept me thinking and, and kept me worrying, if I can be frank. Um, I think that shifting focus to, to what this means for the future of Kazakhstan means um, thinking of this historical moment um, or recharacterizing re, yeah, re the events uh, over the roughly the past week or so as the end of a political transition that began in 2019. Um, and of course, you know the, the political transition I'm referring to, um, the, the one in which um, Nazarbayev made his first, first exit, March 2019, and anointed uh, Takayev as a successor. Um, that's the first exit. In January 2022, the current um, crisis, if you will, uh, is uh, Nazarbayev's second exit. And I think the nature of this second exit has much broader implications for where Kazakhstan is headed. Uh, I hope I'm wrong about a lot of this stuff, frankly, but I, I don't think so. Um, so first, how does Nazarbayev's second exit differ from his first? Um, well, the first exit I would characterize as graceful, well-timed and incomplete. It was graceful because rather than running for a sixth term in, in 2020, uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who as we know is Kazakhstan's first post-Soviet president and he held that position for almost 30 years, longest of any post-Soviet leader, he suddenly resigned on March 19, 2019, and then anointed, as I mentioned, uh, the chairman, who the, uh, Kasim Jamart Takayev, who at the time was chairman of the Senate, as his uh, successor. Takayev was then elected in a snap election in June 19, June 2019, and as Regina mentioned, there were or maybe it was uh, Ed who mentioned uh, there were there were protests that that followed that snap election. Um, nonetheless, it was graceful on the part of Nazarbayev. Uh, it was also, his first exit was well-timed. It was well-timed if the goal was to preserve his legacy. Nazarbayev built his reputation on the perceived su success of his model of development, which was predicated on stability and prosperity via economic liberalization and soft authoritarianism. But these gains peaked in the mid 2010s. And since roughly 2016, the economic situation in the country continued to stagnate due to low oil prices, corruption, and constraints on the growth of the private sector. Not unrelated, Kazakhstan also experienced increased popular discontent and political mobilization, forcing the government to utilize its sovereign wealth fund to both support the economy and to increase social spending. Finally, Nazarbayev's first exit was incomplete. He retained influence over the country in both formal and informal ways. Formally, he was named lifelong chairman of the National Security Council and leading and leader of the ruling Nur Atan political party, which Regina mentioned in, in her comments. He was also able to appoint his own protégés to key positions of power within Takayev's government, including most importantly, Kasim Masima, Karim Masima, excuse me, as head of the country's most powerful security service. So that's Nazarbayev's first exit. Nazarbayev's second exit, uh, couldn't be more different. Uh, it is dishonorable, ill-timed, and complete. Nazarbayev was forced out in the wake of mass protests that have swept Kazakhstan since January 2nd, 2022. Although these protests, as Regina mentioned, and so did Ed, began in response to a steep rise in fuel prices, they quickly escalated from economic grievances to political demands. Foremost among these demands was for the regime to finally distance itself from Nazarbayev. As my colleague Nersay uh, mentioned, one of the, uh, the slogans that was chanted in, this, in the street, not just in Amati, but across the country, um, was you know, old man out, referring to Nazarbayev. Takayev responded by not only dismissing Nazarbayev from his position as chairman of the National Security Council, but also removing Nazarbayev's political allies, including Masima, in the security apparatus and replacing them with his own. 
Although these and other actions did not quell the protests, the initial peaceful political protests, they sent a strong signal that Nazarbayev is being held accountable for Takayev's failure to implement needed and promised reforms. And these reforms are long coming, uh, but the, the regime, as I, I think it was uh, Ed who said it best, the regime has been tone deaf um, toward the, the grievances, uh, the popular grievances uh, across society. I think that they have also uh, changed the meaning of Nazarbayev's legacy. Rather than being held up as the Elbasi, the leader of the nation, and remembered for securing Kazakhstan's stability and prosperity, I think Nazarbayev will likely be equated with Kazakhstan's fragility. More so, given Takayev's choice to repress protesters and invite not just foreign intervention, but Russian intervention, and the CSTO is primarily led by Russian troops. Um, and, and, and so that he, his choice to invite not just, again, foreign intervention, but Russian intervention to prop up his regime, um, Nazarbayev's second exit will also be associated with the country's violent turn and the country's loss of sovereignty. So what are the broader implications of the second exit? Why does Nazarbayev's second exit uh, matter? What does it mean for the future of Kazakhstan? Well, I think it signals three really key points of departure. The first is the end of soft authoritarianism. Takayev has clearly taken the country in a more repressive uh, direction. His decisions to move swiftly to violently suppress the protests and then order the, the, and then the order to shoot to kill on January 7th has opened the door to the use of state violence as a tool of regime stability. By the sixth day of the protest, 3,000 people had been detained. Since then, the number has risen, uh, according to accounts coming out of Moscow, to about 8,000. Um, for sake of comparison, consider this. In Uzbekistan, which is arguably considered the most repressive regime in the region to date, the United, Na the United States Council on um, uh, International Religious Freedom estimates that at its height, Uzbekistan had seven to 10,000 political and religious prisoners uh, detained. So. Kazakhstan is um, on, the, on the level of Uzbekistan in terms of political, of what I would call uh, political detainees, at least at this point. Um, the number killed has also risen markedly from 26 to over uh, 150. Um, so th there's, a, there's a, a violent response. Um, and I'm not saying that this regime has never used violent repression, um, particularly not against protesters. Uh, one acute example of this comes from uh, Genoazen, the very town uh, where the January 22 uh, protests started, uh, where police uh, fired on and killed at least 14 protesters. And uh, this past December, December 2021, was the 10th commemoration, I don't want to say anniversary, certainly, but it was uh, the 10th uh, sort of commemoration of what is known as the Genoazen massacre. And Ed mentioned this as well. And this is something that's very much um, embedded in the, in the memories and uh, the mindset of of the population, particularly in Western Kazakhstan. Um, but the regime regretted this use of force. It, it publicly avowedly regretted this use of force. Um, and so when there were much larger demonstrations in 2014 after a currency devaluation and in 2016 in response to land privatization, for example, and even in 2019 in response to what, what many people saw as, as rigged elections, the regime exercised restraint. There was not an impulse to move to violent repression as I think there has been this time around. The second key point of departure, I would argue, is an end to Kazakhstan's multi-vector foreign policy. Nazarbayev approached foreign policy as a balancing act. Uh, and many people have, have made this argument. Um, he had remained friendly towards Russia while also maintaining good relations with the West so that he could court Western leaders and energy companies. And he did an, an excellent job of it. Takaya's actions bring Kazakhstan further away from the West and closer to both Russia and China. This is not just a mere uh, turn to a more repressive authoritarian regime. It is also clearly a turn toward authoritar authoritarian solidarity with both Russia and China. By taking Kazakhstan's authoritarian regime in the direction of, greater, direction of greater repression, it is now in lockstep with the two major authoritarian players in the region. Dukaya's request for direct military intervention to combat quote unquote foreign terrorists is right out of the Russian and Chinese playbook for justifying state repression. And in fact, Takayev's harsh response to protests was explicitly embraced by both President Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin. But never mind the symbolic implications. Russia has boots on the ground, and this has serious consequences for Kazakhstan's future, even if the intervention is only short term. Uh, for example, for popular discontent um, and thus future popular mobilization. Uh, if 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 Nurseid's uh, 
incorrect. And, and he, he has uh, eyes on the ground that I don't have. Um, he has a perspective that, that I, I can't share because I'm not physically on the ground. I respect very much his point of view. Um, he, he might uh, argue that um, the population, or he has argued that the, the population um, saw, sees Tokayev in a different light, sees him as, as strong um, and um, is, is appreciative of, of his, um, um, his presence during the crisis, uh, and that maybe this has increased in some way his popularity and his legitimacy. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I think that might be a short-term popularity bump, you know, sort of a crisis bump. I think future popular mobilization could be directed against Takayev if, if he continues to remain tone deaf and he continues to um, dismiss uh, popular grievances um, and to sort of buy his own narrative that this was really about um, foreign terrorists and not about real the real need for political and economic reform. Um, at the same time, I think the intervention of, from the Russian troops, the CSTO um, troops, but primarily Russian, um, has implications for Tokayev's loyalty to Putin, and thus for the future types of, of decision, uh, key decisions that we can expect in the future. So, if um, if those uh, commentators that I've read, you know, in in, in Russia are right that in some ways uh, Tokayev brought in the Russians to signal to Putin that he, um, that his attack on Nazarbayev or his, his dismissal on, of Nazarbayev did not mean a change in the political direction of the country, then Takayev clearly is not serious about reform and we're not gonna see serious political reform. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, the other thing I'll say is that on, um, I think it was yesterday, like, like Ed, the, the, the week just uh, seems to go by so quickly and, and, and time has been suspended at the same time in, in a strange way. I was listening to an NPR interview and I think it was yesterday, it might've been the day before, but um, the uh, Kazakh ambassador to the United States, the Kazakhstani ambassador to the United States was being interviewed. And one of the things that he said that I thought sort of confirmed this, this point of view that Takayev's signaling uh, to Putin that, that the end of the Nazarbayev regime does not mean the end of a very close relationship or even a closer relationship between Russia and Kazakhstan um, was that as the NPR interview kept pressing um, the Kazakhstani ambassador over and over again for when the Russians would leave, he finally um, uh, and very combatively said, we are not afraid of Russia. We have no reason to fear them. And I thought that was pretty telling. Um, relatedly, the third and final uh, point of departure, I think, is um, this is the end of Kazakhstan's global image of stability, prosperity, and sovereignty. This is an image that Nazarbayev very carefully cultivated, uh, and this was the case for both international and domestic audiences, because it really helped secure the regime's legitimacy, both at home and abroad. Um, and, but I think that, that this has really changed all of that. Uh, Takayev has a lot of work to do if he's going to rebuild that image. I, I, I really don't think it's possible. Uh, internationally, I think there's a huge loss of credibility in the West. Um, there's also it's a strong signal uh, to the West, uh, as well as to other states in the region, uh, that Russia will not hesitate to intervene in what it considers its sphere of influence. Domestically, um, again, I think the Russian troops could have nationalist backlash. I, I, I may be wrong about this. It, um, I, I think it depends on how long they stay. It depends on what their perceived role is. There's a lot of mixed reports, some reports saying that um, Russia was needed to stabilize the situation. And so it was involved in following the protests or riots, um, uh, the violence on the streets and others saying that Russian troops were only there to uh, protect uh, military installations, airport, government buildings. But there, there are mixed reports there. And so it really depends on what people perceive the role of the Russians to to, to be, how long the Russians stay, um, whether or not um, there's a perceived loss of sovereignty with uh, Russian troops, whether or not Russian troops are perceived as being part of, of um, uh, the, the regime violence. Um, and I think all of this is going to eventually affect regime legitimacy for better or for worse. In their state's right, it seems that the regime's legitimacy will, will grow. Uh, Takaya's popularity may increase. From my perspective, I expect probably to see the opposite. And I think that if the re regime legitimacy is at stake, if Takaya's popularity is, is, is at stake, takes a big hit, um, this could reinforce uh, Kazakhstan's repressive authoritarian trajectory. And I think we'll know more about this. Uh, you know, as, as Regina mentioned, I think we'll know much more about this um, when the elections are held or if the elections are held. We're supposed to have local elections in 2023, new presidential elections in 2024. And the question is, will those elections be held and under what conditions will they be held and what will be the aftermath of those elections? One might argue that the regime could anticipate 
um, that the elections might be a focal point for greater protest and white might try to um, delay them uh, indefinitely. Um, so thank you very much for, um, for the chance to, to be part of this panel. All right, thank you very much, Pauline. Thanks to all of our panelists for really just terrific comments to get us started here. Um, so now we're starting the Q&A here. Um, please just start sending your questions in the chat. Um, I will start going through them uh, in just a minute, but I'm going to take my moderator prerogative to ask uh, essentially three kind of quick questions for maybe all of the panelists. Um, you know, some of which have been covered in in, in uh, slightly different ways by by all three uh, by all four of you. Excuse me. Um, and you know, whoever wants to sort of chime in on this, and then we'll get started with the the Q and A from the audience. So, so I want to ask three questions. So first. Despite some kind of early, somewhat hyperventilating analysis by, of course, no one here, but some analysts about what this CSTO, Russian-led intervention, means for Kazakhstan, reports today from Russian media are that the troops are already leaving. Obviously, we don't know necessarily if they will you know, leave forever, but everyone mostly agrees that if they were involved in any repression, it was minimal and it was actually a fairly small deployment. So was this a successful CSTO intervention? And if so, why? Why did the Russian intervention avoid this quagmire of you know, Russian troops firing on Kazakh protesters that so many people offered they might? So was this successful? If so, why? Second, do we think that the Takayev regime in general and Takayev himself in particular are stronger after the protests or weaker? Did the end, up re the end results of the protest quelling uh, calling on uh, Russian intervention and the massive use of repression. Has this strengthened Takayev regime's position relative to what we might have considered before, or has it weakened it? And how has it affected his position vis-a-vis -vis other elites? And my third question is a bit of gazing into the future, the counterfactual future, but if these protests had succeeded and Takayev had left office, what would have come next? So what type of regime change would have been possible in Kazakhstan? What would have likely replaced Takayev? Um, if the if demands for uh, Nazarbayev sort of ouster and had morphed into you know more direct calls for Takayev to step down, and what would that have looked like? And in the meantime, I will start looking through these other questions. If anyone so wants I'm, to jump in, on I'm that. happy to start if, if if that's okay with Regina and, and Ed. Um, I I think with the CSTO, it depends on how you look at it. Uh, was it successful? From the perspective of the CSTO, it was hugely successful because it's actually a, a, an organization that does something. Uh, it's been an organization that's been, you know, relatively dismissed. That it has no role. That it's nominal anyway. In, in, you know, it's it's just nominal, and um, it was actually called upon to intervene, and it did so, you know, immediately. Um, so from from the, the two big winners here, the CSTO is a big winner. And Takayev is a big winner, I think. So that kind of segues to your second question. Um, I think it's made Takayev stronger in the short term. He's certainly stronger vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I think I actually think this argument that that comes out of Carnegie Moscow. It's not my argument, but I think it's smart that one of the ways that Takayev was signaling that his um, dismissal of Nazarbayev was not uh, a rejection of the Russian regime. The Russian regime was very close to Nazarbayev and the Nazarbayev regime. Um, but rather an embracing and, a, and, a, and a, of the Russian regime. Um, that was one of the real the reasons that Takaya uh, invited the CSTO, I believe. Uh, um, so I think it's made him stronger vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, I think it's made him stronger vis-a-vis -vis other elites because uh, you know again he's he's shown his his position uh, is is um, uh, the, the the ouster of, of Nazarbayev, as I said, that second exit is, is complete. Takayev's in charge. He now has actual full control over the country, uh, as long as he can get the security, can keep the security forces on his side. And I think he can with Russian help. I think that's that was part of the signal. Um, but it's it's not clear, um, you know. And Nurse and I disagree about this. It's not clear what the effect of repression on the protesters is going to have. It's, it's really about the extent to which society by some of uh, Takayev's narrative and whether or not Takayev actually engages in meaningful reform. And I'm, I can't predict that, but I'm not optimistic, uh, I would say. And finally, um, asking whether the protest has succeeded, um, uh, whether a different regime would have um, uh, uh, materialized, that wasn't the point, my, from my perspective, um, that wasn't the point of, for what I've seen on the ground, uh, or, or read it from others that have been um, bear, bear witness to, to what's going on, on the ground. The protesters' demands were not for the ouster of Takaya, they were for the, for the ouster of Nazarbayev. And so I don't think we can measure the protest success in terms of 
um, whether Takaya stays or goes. Oh, I don't think it was an anti-regime protest. Um, I don't think it was a revolutionary protest. I think it was make these political and economic changes, these reforms, you know, implement your promises. Um, and um, one of those certainly was distancing uh, the regime, the Takaya regime from the Nazarbayev regime. So it's done that, but now what? Will it continue um, to do that in a meaningful way? And so that's that's what I would say. Great, anyone else wanna jump in on that? Sure. Um, yeah, no, those are, those are great comments and processing as, as usual, as always, actually, <laughs> Pauline gets me, gets me thinking. So thank you. Um, uh, so on the CSTO, yes, totally agree. hundred percent successful from the CSTO perspective, though it's not clear again, you know, how much the CSTO exists separate from, you know, uh, from being an instrument of Russian foreign policy. So it strengthens Russia. It's a success for Russia. Whether it's a success for the CST CSTO as separate from Russia is maybe a matter of semantics. But um, Tokayev, is he weaker or stronger after the uh, after all of these events? I mean, I think that's right. He's probably stronger um, at the moment, but at the cost, uh, at the cost of a... Uh, uh, a loss of sovereignty, right? Um, or at least the perception that there's a there that this introduces a whole series of vulnerabilities on the part of the regime that where Tokayev is now uh, beholden to is the strong version, but or at, you know at least has to take into consideration Russian interests always now. So I, I do think it's the end, as Pauline rightly mentioned in her in her earlier earlier remarks, the end of this multi-vector foreign policy. So. The cost there is significant in terms of the loss of sovereignty and what that means. I don't think anything happens, any major reforms happen without Russia Russia casting its shadow across any kind of deliberations or any kind of consultations, any kind of change that might begin to materialize. And I also think that, you know, you know, the short term stability, I think that there it introduces longer term fragilities, right? Because, you know, the brutality of the crackdown. I assume, just like as we saw with Jean Uzen, you know, you, you can keep the information bottled up for a while, but I do think enough people were deeply traumatized by this. And the spin you put on that, right, is foreign terrorists or it's business interests mobilizing their thugs or whatever, only works until it doesn't work, right? And then, and, and people begin, they saw something with their own eyes. And I think it's easy enough, especially in our, the world we live in now, to, 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 to see other narratives simultaneously. And then you go, oh, no way, that was, that was Tokayev who was responsible for, for the brutality. It could be a possible narrative going forward. So that's, that introduces a new, a new fragility. Um, the, the finally, the future, if the protest had succeeded. So, I mean, yeah, I think that's right. I don't think that there was a clearly articulated, you know, Tokayev out uh, kind, of, kind of thing. But this is really the question going forward. So I'm not going to answer your question, particularly as a, you know, as a crisp, you know, counterfactual. But, but I do think that the real question is, um, can Tokayev, and Pauline was getting to this, can Tokayev distance himself from Nazarbayev? Can he, because he really is a protege, right, of, of Nazarbayev. And, and to what extent will the general population, especially those who harbor grievances that, you know, are hard to address in, in the short term, um, uh, even with even assuming the political will to do so, um, to what extent are they going to are, are are those who were involved in protests and various and there are various protesters we could break that down further. But are they going to see Tokayev as really essentially different from Nazarbayev versus an opportunist, uh, somebody from that mold who has done you know too little and and unfortunately with the new cabinet. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know a lot of these characters, if, if I can be very honest. But from what I've heard, most people are, you know, they're not Nazarbayev people. But the question is, are they just replacing, you know, or, or will they come to be viewed as just replacing one kind of corrupt elite with another corrupt elite, right? And that's the key question, because you may be continuing Nazarbayevism, even if you've made a move from Nazarbayev. I jump right, in Regina. with just two tiny points. First of all, on the CSTO, there's a lot we don't know yet. I think we already said this. Um, the Russians had very few troops on the ground, but evidently were airlifting massive amounts of equipment and other types of resources. And what that looks like over the long run, I think is gonna be really interesting and important. Um, for Putin, certainly, and I'll just opine, this is a success in the sense that 
the 30% of the population who truly supports him and wants him to be a strong leader sees Russian force coming in, going out, costless, just the way Putin likes an intervention, right? Short and sweet. And, and so in, in the short term, it's good for Putin and probably has very little um, cost. On what this does for Tokaya, for a Tokaya regime personally, I, I think everybody said the same thing. There are strong trade-offs, but I want to underscore something I heard Nur Said say, which is a, a huge strength or potential strength, which is renegotiating with business uh, leaders to bring them into his camp and keep them safe and protect them. So this is going to be a rebuilding of loyalties. And all of a sudden, this looks like an important structural opportunity. On the other hand, popular expectations are so high now for significant change that I agree it's difficult to see how it's coming. That, that on the one hand, he has this structural advantage in this moment, but in the medium to longer term, it, it looks like something threatening. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for answering my questions. Uh, so now we'll turn to the audience. We have one from, uh, we're going to go in somewhat random order here, but one from Maria Popova. Uh, so she asked something that I think a lot of different people have been asking throughout this. And so she says she wants to know with, uh, you know, now with the, with the passing of time, are we any closer to knowing whether Nazarbayev's very quick dismissal is a signal that Takayev thought this was the best way to prevent further escalation of the protests, or that he used the opportunity to send Nazarbayev into retirement and consolidate his own power, or both. So this is a question for the panelists. Can I jump in here? I'm gonna say uh, both, it was both. That we often impute to these strong men some sort of mastermind kind of seeing the whole chessboard and moving in a brilliant stroke. And I think in the moment when Nazarbayev was asked to leave, dismissed, um, it was pretty early on in the process. And then very quickly, it became something else. But I want to push back on the idea that this was sort of a mastermind stroke from the beginning uh, but rather a set of strategic decisions that have worked out pretty well so far, but create different kinds of problems. Uh, uh, Pauline or Ed, would you like to, Ed? I just want to say that Regina said it beautifully. I mean, I think that that's, I think that that's exactly right. I think that especially in the fog of, um, or in, the, in the, the rough and tumble of rapidly changing events, it becomes very difficult, even if you have a master plan, to, to execute your master plan. So it, it's possible that he had this in mind. Um, you know, I mean, I can't imagine that he was it, he was immune to thinking, um, at least in hypotheticals, uh, at what point will, um, you know, it, it not be useful or might it be counterproductive. But this is an opportunity, I would say. It's probably a moment that, uh, that he seized rather than something he planned out. Yeah, I would just add, thank you. Adam. I would just add that um, they're not mutually exclusive, and I think that's that's kind of what Regina and, and Ed were saying as well. Um, and that um, you know, I, I said in response to a question in a, in a different panel, you know, that that I actually think Takai have kind of panicked. You know, I don't. I, again, I don't think he masterminded. It was they were super strategic. Um, at the same time, I think that there must have been some cost benefit analysis going on in his head once he got rid of Nazarbayev in terms of thinking about how he was going to be able to maintain control. And I think that was connected to some of the other decisions that he made. He wanted the protests to stop. He didn't want them to escalate. He, he was thinking, I think in his mind was Kyrgyzstan. Um, he, he, you know, he, he had no intention of um, losing control and stepping down. Okay, great. Thanks for that. That was a really good question. Thanks, Maria, for the, for sending that along too. So I'm going to maybe combine two questions I have here from Amanda and Zarina. Um, so they both ask about the role played by international organizations in this process. So um, uh, both Zarina and Amanda want to know the kind of role that, you know, in one case, specifically the organization of Turkic states, which sort of issued a statement supporting Kazakhstan. Uh, did this matter? Did this kind of help the Kazakh regime's legitimacy affect its foreign policy orientation? Um, it, the second kind of question, I suppose, is that it is, is from Zarina and that's, you know, did human rights organizations kind of play any real meaningful role in this, in this situation? Has their role changed over time? Um, 
et cetera. So if anyone wants to jump in on the role of uh, international organizations, both based in the West and, you know, other ones, maybe the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, other types of, you know, organizations playing any kind of role other than the CSTO in this process. Looks like Ed is maybe yeah. jumping in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that the organization of Turkic you know, states uh, with that would have had too much of too much of an influence. I think that, you know, at least especially in the moment of crisis, it would seem that the only international entanglements that matter <laughs> might be with Russia, uh, you know, with, especially with uh, with the West having withdrawn and China's, uh, you know, um, sitting this one out, uh, which is, you know, typical and consistent with uh, China's self-understanding of its role um, uh, and the sort of division of labor that we see between China and Russia in in um, in uh, in Central Asia. But on the on the other question about human rights, um, I'm not sure. I, I may be taking it in a slightly different direction. So apologies if, if if I do. But you know, human rights organizations are interesting. I mean, there were there was stuff from uh, Human Rights Watch and so you know during the crisis as it was unfolding. You know, statements. Uh, pr about protecting human rights and so on. I'm fairly sure that that fell on deaf ears um, in uh, in Kazakhstan, certainly in the in the elite. But um, I would point out a, a slightly different role that these kinds of organizations play, because you know, uh, for example, I think it was Human Rights Watch did a, um, a three or four years ago did a terrific report, and it was in Russian and in and in, in English about. Um, about uh, dirty tricks in, in, in labor, uh, uh, regimes dirty tricks with regard to labor mobilization, right? And, uh, you know, so it wasn't strictly a sort of human rights, although it's not unrelated to it, but it was a really about what the regime does to undercut the labor movement and, and uh, prevent. And, and, and I don't know how widely that circulated, but it's an interesting sort of question because it's, it's sort of how do we get from these local protests or protests that are local and maybe with specific kinds of grievances to something, some kind of broader awareness of, again, linking my fate, even though I'm not an oil worker, to the fate of oil workers, right? And so I, I think that, you know, this, the, the role of these kinds of things, uh, you know, again, realm of hypothesis, but we, we might consider that. That's just a small little bit I wanted to throw in there. Right, thanks, Ed. Anyone else like to jump in on this one? So let me just add two very quick points. Uh, the other person who was quick, who was, I think maybe almost first to jump in to congratulate Takayev on his swift uh, dealing with disorder was uh, Victor Urban. So we're looking not only at sort of the role of these organizations, but this informal role of this network of black hats that exist who think uh, a lot about demonstrating order, trying to create fear beyond their own borders, right? Fear, repression, Belarus has been, the Belarusian example has been used very effectively to create fear of disorder, but also state violence beyond its borders. And I think that's some of what's happening. Um, Orban's may be in trouble. Opposition's pretty fragmented. Aragon's in trouble in Turkey. We we see threats to these black hats, and I think that that this episode has deep symbolic meaning, demonstration effect. Yeah, I I I wasn't going to jump in on this, but I I that just triggered something that I've been thinking about a lot, which is this this move toward authoritarian solidarity. I think I, I mentioned it in my remarks, but it just it's this broader implication of you know can you any longer be an authoritarian regime that has friendly relations with the West. I mean, it seems like there's a there's a real choice to be made. There's there's um, it's an either or. Okay, interesting. Oh uh, yeah, Ed, unless, you're Saudi. Unless, you're unless you're Saudi. Unless you're Saudi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I, uh, Pauline? I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. So Pauline, no, no, no. I, I just I mean, there's, you know, there's there. But I, I think you know these are the exceptions. I think Pauline's probably right about the general trends, but um, there's there seems to be a firewall around the Saudi American relationship, at least for now. I I just wanted to say that I've been really not a believer in the rhetoric of new Cold War, but these events and some of these um, ideologic uh, differences again between authoritarian capitalism, 
liberal democracy. It's starting uh, the the actual um, use of the the CTSO to to you. We're starting to get actions behind the rhetoric. We're starting to see ideologic divisions that are real. It's starting to be hard to cross the border unless you're Saudi or maybe Qatar. UAE, I don't know, but but we're but I think that we're we're really entering a new phase, exactly as Pauline described it, and this to me is a is a big change. So maybe to piggyback off that, to keep the Cold War going, let's play. I want to have maybe kind of two related questions. So first, let's play a little Cold War Kremlinology, and ask like, what is Putin's main takeaway from this? In and I'm what I mean by this question is. Many people have made the argument that Putin watched Nazarbayev's transition in 2019 with great interest, not only because it was a friendly neighboring autocrat, but because it offered a potential path for him to extricate himself peacefully from day-to-day governing of the country to become the kind of Lee Kuan Yew or an ERA kind of type transition that we saw in earlier periods. So what does he take away from this? And secondly, on this, you know, so I, my, you know, previously skeptical of this kind of, you know, Russian intervention on behalf of autocracy type stuff and the fact that, you know, the Russians declined to intervene in in multiple other occasions. So, so why, especially if the protests were not about removing Takayev, why did Russia intervene here? And especially given that Peskov earlier that day had given essentially, this is a sovereign issue, we're not really going to do it. There was no real indication from the Russians that they were at all actively considering coming in. And yet they did. And in ways that are actually quite different from even Belarus in 2020, when they were quite silent for the first few days, and then eventually came through with a pretty strong position in favor of Lukashenko. So what, you know, no to Armenia, no to Kyrgyzstan thrice in recent years, you know, why Kazakhstan now, I guess is my question, panelists, as well as what is Putin taking away from this? So um, maybe I'll get, oh, sorry, Regina, did you want to go? Okay. Um, no, I mean, I just, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about this, uh, 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 you know, this is not, if this is the Cold War, of course, or new Cold War, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's got a different sort of, um, it's a, if there's an authoritarian international, it's a, it's a nimble light authoritarian international. Like this is not, you know, the, the substance of ideology is, it's a pretty thin, it's a, it's a solidarity club, right? It's a, um, it's, it's, we agree on what we're not, you know, but now I think it does have a little bit of teeth. Um, but again, I, I, I would expect that this is the perfect intervention for Putin, right? Because this is the one where you don't get, you don't, uh, you mentioned the quagmire, you're not shooting protesters, right? You don't, um, you get in and you get out. You demonstrate the power of, um, and, and indeed the, the utility of this kind of, of, this kind of arrangement. Um, and of course, on the backdrop of, you know, ongoing standoff uh, regarding, you know, Ukraine and so on and so forth. So this is, this is the perfect sort of thing. And if you know, we know from like Alex Cooley's work, the, the deeper the, the the military presence, the more permanent and durable, the more likely you're going to get ensnared in local politics, right? Like a light touch where you can project power from just across the border, that's way better for for this uh, for these folks. Um, the second thing you asked, uh oh, what was your what was your second? Uh-oh. Putin. Putin. What is his takeaway from this Kremlin? Well, I think I think his Putin. His takeaway is exactly that. That. All right, the second point was 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 something else, but I'll let others I'll let others go, and maybe it'll come to me. So first, I was hoping Regina was going to say that I was wrong about the authoritarian solidarity because I really do want to be wrong. Um, I just I'll start with that because that's that's where Ed uh, finished, and I'll go back to to Putin. But um, which of course authoritarian solidarity is related to Putin. I I, I don't think that. Um, this trend is happening solely because of what um, Russia and China are doing. It's also what the West is doing vis-a-vis Russia and China. Um, so the, the Russia-China partnership is becoming increasingly focused on being anti-Western because the West is also focusing on, I mean, particularly under our previous administration, on being anti, not Ru- Russian per se, but anti-China. Um, I, I just think there's a lot there's a lot to be said there uh, in terms of, of how this has all transpired. It's not just that this the authoritarian camp is, uh, you know, learning that that they um, they are ideologically aligned and that they need to have organizations uh, akin to NATO with more 
teeth, as, as Ed put it, but that the West is, has been mm, complicit, if you will. Um, it, it, so it's not a trend that's happened in a vacuum. I guess that's what I want to say, but, but I'm not saying it very articulately. Um, I think Putin's big takeaway is that the first exit can lead to the second exit. And so he's going to think <laughs> he's going to think long and hard about trying to make a, a first exit like Nazarbayev did. Um, and um, in terms of why Russia intervened, I, I think a lot of it is just uh, on, on Russia's part. I think there was a cost uh, benefit analysis that was done. I think it was very strategic, and the cost of instability in Kazakhstan are just too great. Um, uh, they, they're they outweigh uh, the potential cost of an intervention, particularly if they thought they could keep it uh, short and sweet. Um, Kyrgyzstan just just wasn't the cost of instability there just aren't as high, you know, for m multiple reasons, you know, border reasons, demographic reasons, oil reasons. <laughs> um, so that that would be that would be my my kind of really basic take on that. Great, Regina, have you? I can't now. I'm, kept, I'm losing track of who's all had a chance to weigh in here. Otherwise, Ed has I remembered that, his second that, point. Ed and Pauline that. sort of covered it. I I I think that Putin. Putin learned he either needs to retire to his palaces without power um, or to stay in office forever, right? Which I think he did not want to do. Um, but I also want to underscore that what another thing that Putin has learned is that many of the conditions that were in place in Kazakhstan that led to this flash are also prevalent in Russia. And if you want to know why Russian's regime acts this way often, it's because they feel this regime has felt since the early 2000s that it's sitting on top of a powder keg and they have not solved any of the problems that have caused that powder keg. And those threats have only grown and there are no solutions on the horizon. And this last year in Russia, we have seen an incredible move towards authoritarianism that is unlikely to stop. And so maybe it validated that move. Great, thank you. Uh, and Ed has remembered his second point, so Ed. <laughs> Miracles will never cease. Um, so yeah, my second point was, uh, I, you know, your question was why, why, why send troops to Kazakhstan? I mean, let's not forget that CSTO was asked, right? By by Tokayev, unless we think, oh, oh, Pauline's shaking her head. Unless we think that there was some kind that that was just the end of a process. Um, they were asked before in other interventions, right, and declined. In Kyrgyzstan, multiple times in Armenia, they were asked to come in and declined. I'm not sure there was ever a form. Oh, in Armenia, okay, I don't know, but in Kyrgyzstan, I'm not sure there was ever a formal ask being made. It was sort of like the, you know, there's a there's a, there's a process. I mean, so then you know, but okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So it may be that uh, maybe that I got this wrong. There was a call. Telephone justice. Right. OK, got it. It's all done on the phone. Fair enough. And, and of course, here. we only get this gesture because we're over 50. <laughs> That's right. Good point. <laughs> Adam, did you understand it? No problem. I did. I actually did. Yeah, I'm not that I'm not that young. But, uh, but I'm flattered that you thought I might not get it. So there you go. I actually um, thought okay. you just thought you were at a rock concert. You were that's right. Yeah, that's right. I think it does mean something like love or something. I don't know. Love's a different one. I don't know. Hang 10. Um, okay. Well, uh, I don't know if we'll have, I guess. Okay. So we have one maybe final question. Somebody wants to weigh in on this quickly and then uh, just any concluding remarks. And then I just want to thank my panelists. But so we have a question from, from Christopher, which I think is a question a lot of people in Brussels and Washington are asking right now and whether or not the events recently in Kazakhstan change at all uh, prospects for conflict in Ukraine. So has this, uh, it was this such a successful CSTO intervention that it essentially is gonna have no effect on Ukraine? Is this something that uh, is gonna affect other Russian foreign policy uh, behavior in the near term? So I'll just say that I've been trying to follow the military implications of troops into Kazakhstan. And evidently, well, we see that it didn't stop the movement of troops from Buryatia to the Western Front. So troops have been moving during the protest period and subsequent to it. Uh, the forces that were put in from, I think, Tomsk uh, are now going back. And so militarily, this wasn't a big burden. It was a burden on transport. It really did burden transport facilities. So that's an important thing. Whether or not those are gonna continue, we're not clear on. And 
you know, bandwidth. We again sort of ascribe this regime with this incredible capacity to keep balls in the air and juggle. And it's in fact quite conservative. And so I'm sure this wasn't the first choice of the Putin regime. Um, and I do think it takes away a little bit of bandwidth, although I did see um, that some, you know, in the in the constant disinformation machine. Uh, announcements that the talks between the US and Russia over Kazakhstan, sorry, over Ukraine had come to a, 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 an impasse and um, all was dark. So it's hard to know, right? But militarily, I don't think this is a big challenge. Okay, okay if anyone wants to weigh in on that, um, my own two cents would be that warm weather and mud is probably going to be a bigger problem for a intervention in Ukraine than uh, than moving troops from Kazakhstan. But we'll see if they overcome that problem as well. But um, okay, I want to thank uh, all the panelists, which is a terrific set of experts here today and a really good conversation. Thanks for joining us at WCED. And I just want to remind uh, everyone of two things before we go. First is that uh, all of the panelists present today have actually recently written uh, really illuminating pieces for the Monkey Cage blog in the Washington Post, uh, which Derek will hopefully share in the chat and uh, everyone should check out whenever they get a chance. And um, also please join us on January 25th for another great panel here at WCD. Uh, so thanks everyone, stay healthy and uh, be safe. So thanks a lot.